So as you may recall, we were looking way back in deep time and we'd come up to about 70 million years ago to the present and then we were just about to talk about what happens as we go in and out of ice ages over the last two million years. Uh, just to recall what we saw in those very deep time examples, hundreds of millions of years, we saw that the planet's climate isn't stable. It goes between cold and warm periods. Uh, that those changes have large biological effects and that when they're abrupt they're sometimes accompanied with extinction or radiations of species, emergence of species uh, presumably filling newly suitable climatic niches. And that's a pattern that's important to keep in mind because, as, as we'll see, the pl planet's climate is changing even more quickly now, or at least we can resolve the speed of the changes. And those offer some clues into how species may respond to human-induced climate change from our putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So let's preview some principles that we'll be looking at as we look at the record of the last few hundred thousand years really. Uh, the ice ages have lasted about two million years but we're just going to look at the more recent record because that's where we have better fossil record, better pollen record, better ice core records and so we'll be zooming in sort of on the last 50 or 100 thousand years um, but certainly the period extends longer than that and from throughout that period we know that there are several principles uh, of how species respond to climate change that are applicable to now and to what's going to happen in the future with human-induced climate change. So those principles, and we've, we've mentioned some of them already, are upslope trapping of climate. So it's cooler upslope, so as things warm, species will try to track their suitable climates um, by moving upslope. Poleward tracking or latitudinal tracking, <laughs> same idea, and we've talked about it a bit as we looked at the Cape. Uh, species are going to try to track those suitable climates, move towards cooler regions, which means towards the poles, so north in the northern hemisphere, south in the southern hemisphere. So both of those two tracking expectations, upslope and poleward, are due to species having unique climatic tolerances and due to them trying to move into what are colder regions as climates warm to sort of maintain the climate that they prefer. If we can anthropomorphize for a minute. The other principle, the third principle, is that of species individualistic range shifts. So if you think back to those animations I was showing of the proteas and the cape, uh, did they all move in the same ways? Did all those little animations move in the same way? No. So some of them move. We saw some species expanding as climate warmed. We saw some species contracting up into the uplands, just as we expect with the warming. Um, and those upward contractions and southward contractions were a little different for every one of those species that I was able to find on my little list and, and put up in the animation. <coughs> so what that means is, and the reason for that, is that every species has unique climatic tolerances. And so if you garden, you know that there are certain species that you can't grow in temperate climates or tropical climates because the climate, the climate just isn't right for those species. And that's generally true of plants everywhere and vertebrates and all, all species everywhere. They have unique climatic tolerances and so that as climate changes, they're going to move with climate in a way that's very unique to that particular species. And so what that means is that if two species are found together today, they're not necessarily going to move off together in exactly the same way. They may move in different ways, they may move completely opposite of one another, uh, and as a result they may no longer coexist in future climates as climate warms. And that brings us to the final principle, which is that of novel and disappearing ecosystems. So as species move off in their own unique ways, they may 
not co co-occur anymore. And so that's a disappearing ecosystem or association type. So sometimes we refer to plant communities as if they're things that are very cohesive and, and interwoven and, and will hang together forever. Um, but in fact, um, plant communities or plant associations are really just temporal or um, species that are coexisting at a particular time uh, because they have the same climatic tolerances in that particular space. So as climate changes, they may move apart and that vegetation association may disappear. We may not see those two species in association with one another anymore. So that's a disappearing ecosystem. But if ecosystems disappear, new ones will appear. There'll be new species that one or the other of those two species is associated with, and those are new ecosystems. So we don't expect that all the plants that we find co-occurring in a particular montane forest are going to stay together as climate changes. We expect in general that they'll all move up slope, but they'll do so in their own unique way, and so, and so some that are found together may not be found together anymore and some that aren't seen together now will come together and form an association. So those are some of the challenges for conservation because if we're used to thinking that species are just gonna stay where they are and they're associated with certain other species and that's always gonna be the case, we now think that as the planet warms due to climate change from human pollution, that those things aren't gonna always be true, that species won't always be in exactly the same place, and they may not always coexist with the same species they coexist with now. So are there any questions about those principles before we go on to look at how we came to believe that those things are true about climate change and species responses? Alu? Symbiosis associates and species are mutual relation. Mm -hmm. So, if this mutual relation, the species can go <coughs> in different ways. Can they? Can can they independently? Right. So, what if species have a mutualistic relationship? Something that seems to be very tightly co-evolved. Uh, for instance, a pollinator that can, has a specific adaptation to, to pollinate a plant that has a very specialized shaped flower. Uh, well, some of those uh, associations are tightly co-evolved and they're more likely to move together than, than other species associations. But sometimes we're surprised as well. We've st also seen that species that we thought were completely co-evolved certain species of fig that are only pollinated by, we thought, by certain species, actually can be pollinated by other species, but depending on the circumstances, we may only see one species that can, can pollinate that plant, for instance. So, yes, sometimes species that are tightly co-evolved are more likely to move together, uh, but sometimes we may, may be surprised as well. Species we thought were very tightly co-evolved and may well be tightly co-evolved, can I actually survive without each other as well. So we, sh we shouldn't just assume that species that we see together today will stay together. Yes. Emily, you next. Oh, yes. No, wait. Oh, sorry. I mean, go ahead. And no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. He's yielding to the, to the delegate from Kid. Okay. Yeah. Would it be correct to assume that uh, between outslope and forward tracking, mm -hmm. To a certain extent, that so the question was, would we expect upslope tracking to apply in the tropics more, and uh, pole uh, latitudinal tracking to apply in the high latitudes more? I think that's generally <laughs> the case partly because the tropics are already warm uh, and we certainly expect upslope tracking in the tropics um, and to a, to a certain extent we're seeing large-scale latitudinal tracking in the high 
high latitudes, but we're also seeing upslope tracking. So we expect both things in both places. I think maybe it's a, a fair way to think about it. The tropical mountains will be especially vulnerable in the tropics uh, to, to, to species range movements. Aladdin, you had something? Yes. Is it possible uh, to make a list of animals and plants which extinct due to climate change? that are extinct due to climate change. Yeah. Yes, well, so we're gonna talk about that. And interestingly, that's a short list in, in the glacial interglacial periods, which is a bit surprising because we might think, well, here we're having all this climate change, we should be having lots of species extinctions as well. In fact, the evidence seems to indicate that there were some extinctions as we entered the Pleistocene so sort of as we got into this period of this cooler period and period of fluctuations between ice ages and interglacials, uh, there's evidence of some extinctions in that period, but there isn't a lot of evidence of extinctions accompanying each of the glacial interglacial shifts, which is interesting. Uh, there, there's evidence of sort of continental or regional extinctions, but surprisingly few global extinctions associated with the glacial interglacial periods. Uh, so yes, it is possible to, to create a list, but it's a short list. And so one of the questions about human-induced climate change is, will the future be different? And the short answer is, yes, it, it will be different because it's warming on an already warm climate. We'll talk about that. And humans have changed land use all over the planet. So species aren't able to adjust by moving through fully natural landscapes. So there are those two reasons why we're much more likely to see extinctions due to warming from human-caused climate change than we see from either warming or cooling going in and out of ice ages into glacials and interglacial periods. Okay, so those are good questions. Let's go on and look at just some ways that we, what the sources of evidence for climate change and species movement records really are. So this is a photo of an ice core. And one of the main ways that we know about what's happening uh, with climate change is by drilling ice cores down into the Greenland ice sheet and looking at trapped bubbles of gas or isotopic signatures in those ice cores. Um, I don't know if you can quite see it here, but you can see some of the laminations in this ice core. So in Greenland, each year there's a seasonal snowfall. You wind up with a layer of snow and ice that's gradually compressed. And you can see that in an ice core, and that lets you find out where you are in time. You can count years in Greenland ice cores and count back in time to figure out where you are. And then you can look at isotopes or trap gas to answer questions about what was happening with climate, CO2 in the atmosphere, and temperature uh, in those past climates. So if you look at some of those records, now these are pretty smoothed out. The Greenland ice core records are much noisier than this. But if we kind of smooth things out a lot, you can take a couple of prox... Hello. You can take... A what we'll be seeing here in a moment <laughs> are two different things that we can interpret from the gases and isotopes that we count, that we measure in Greenland ice cores, one of which is a proxy of sea level, one of which is a t proxy of global mean temperature. Does everybody know what I mean when I say proxy? Uh, no. A proxy is like a surrogate. So we talked about surrogate species, one species standing for another. Proxies are, um, for instance, isotopes uh, in ice that tell it, that we believe tell us about what temperature was at that time, depending on the level of isotope. Um, so that we, you know, there's not a, an actual temperature record in the Greenland ice core. There are different uh, isotopes or trap gases that we can analyze that tell us about temperature, or in the case of trap gases, really directly about. CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, not, don't know. Power, so. <laughs> okay. Oh, the whole power went out. Oh. Well, I could turn my laptop around and, and show it to you. Um, okay, well, too bad. I could 
the next thing I have is a very nice photograph of a paleobotanist lowering a coring tool into a tropical lake. Um, but let's pause for a minute, since we don't have visuals, and see if there are any other questions in the hopes that our visuals may come back and I won't have to uh, 